Um, so thank everybody for being here. My name is Marina Roberts. I use Shebird pronouns, and I'm the current co-chair of the DSA Housing Committee. Um, this is an event on uh, co-ops in partnership with the Austin Cooperative Business Association and College Housing. So uh, this is Ryan Mill. He is going to be giving a presentation and maybe answering some questions. Um, so he is the on the board of the Austin Cooperative Business Association. So thank everybody for coming and um, have, a, have a good presentation. Cool. Uh, Just uh, like some logistical things real quick. If you have to go to the bathroom, it's outside and then a right and then a right. And I think you can help yourself to water cups and then water by, by the ice machine. So just in case y'all y'all need any of that. Um, but as Marie said, my name is Ryan Nill. Um, and just a little bit about my co-op background. I moved into the Arrakis co-op in 2009 as a college student. Uh, I was actually attending the Macomb School of Business at the time and thought that co-op would be a great way to apply my business school knowledge. I moved in in 2008, the economy collapsed in 2008, and I had to reevaluate my life. Um, and at some point I wrote this for the Daily Texan. Uh, they didn't really like me at the Combs after that. Uh, I kind of thought that traditional conventional firms were essentially amoral, and I thought co-ops were a great alternative. Um, so when I graduated from college, uh, as when you graduate from one of the student co-ops, you get scooted out. And I founded, along with many other people, uh, the Law Reunion Cooperative Apartments. Um, so I'm on the right in this photo. Uh, Gatlin also helped found it. Were you the one who coughed? I heard a cough, I thought of you. <laughs> Gatlin is one of my co-founders. Um, I've also founded the Key Fig Years co-op. It's a worker co-op. We do bookkeeping and bookkeeping related stuff. Um, so that's that's my co-op background. Um, kind of like why I'm, you know, been doing housing co-op for 10 years and kind of why I'm here. Um, but why I assume most of y'all are here is, oh, and I'm with ACB. This is why I assume most of y'all are here because of the idea that cooperatives, because they are a form of collective ownership, um, by people who typically don't have the opportunity to own businesses, that it's very much in line with the socialist ideals. Um, and hopefully, if, if you can get enough of these co-ops, um, it's kind of like little mini socialist institutions uh, that eventually most of society will operate under ways, under methods that are amenable to, to socialism. Um, and y'all are curious, this is from uh, Framework's policy about worker co-ops. So if that's something you're interested in, I can forward you that information at some point. Uh, so as I mentioned, I thought co-ops were a great kind of moral values-based uh, system. And uh, we pretty much operate amongst, uh, with uh, seven cooperative principles in mind. Uh, I think Rob mentioned that they have some awesome posters up there. So you can see our awesome posters. Um, I featured a couple of them in the presentation. Um, the first one is uh, about members and who members are. And members are the people that benefit from the co-op. Uh, typically, they're like consumers or workers. Um, and the, the key is that it's open and voluntary. Um, here's, here's the text of the, the, one of the few slides with a wall of text that in case you're curious what they actually are, they'll, they'll be there. Um, so it's open and voluntary. Um, so you have to be able to accept the rights and responsibilities of being a co-op member. So for the housing situation, you gotta, um, usually you have to do a certain amount of labor, four to five hours of labor a week to participate in the operation of the co-op. Uh, for a worker co-op, you gotta be able to get a job at the worker co-op and then maintain a job. Um, so there is some responsibilities uh, for being a co-op member that you have to live up to. Um, there's also a kind of open membership piece, which is essentially a non-discrimination piece. And you have pretty much all the, 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 class, the protected classes you're used to seeing. Although I will point out there is one protected cl class that you're probably not used to seeing, which is political class, what your political beliefs are. So even though co-ops are, uh, at least housing co-ops are pretty socialist in a lot of ways, you can't have an exclusively socialist co-op uh, to follow the seven principles. The second principle is about democratic member control. And I think this is really one of the key uh, principles. Um, and it's, they're operated on a one member, one vote basis. Um, and 
it's pretty like in you know, invi inviolable. You have to do that. And there's actually another principle that emphasizes that point. Um, and so a lot of co-ops, if they're small, operate kind of like a direct democracy. Uh, most housing co-ops have a meeting once a week and everyone can go and vote on policy and decide how to operate the co-op. Um, if it gets bigger, you tend to see kind of more federated republic, representative republic style democracies. So going, you know, continuing on with the, the housing co-op. Uh, in this building, there are three co-ops um, and each of the three co-ops in this building elects someone to a board, which kind of makes system-wide co-op policies. So the third principle is economic member participation. Um, this is about how you members benefit from the operations of the co-op and also kind of what people have to pitch in. Uh, so because co-ops operate a lot like normal businesses, you can get a profit, which we call surplus. And that does get distributed in, in a dividend type way. But instead of the standard dividend, which is based on shares or percent ownership based on capital, it's based on what we call patronage. And it's based on how much you use your co-op. So it's use base. Um, housing co-ops actually don't really do this very effectively for reasons that I'll get into, because um, there are a lot of other ways that people benefit from the housing co-op. But in a consumer co-op um, like Weeksville or REI, you benefit from the number of purchases you make. In a worker co-op, it's based on a, the ratio of hours that you work. So the person that works the most hours gets the most um, patronage at the end of the year. Um, and you also share your losses. There's also a component about like paid in capital to get the co-op started. Um, and this varies based on the life cycle of the co-op. If it's an early stage co-op, uh, people are basically going to have to contribute as much money as it's going to take to start the business. Um, otherwise, you got no business. Um, if it's a well-established co-op, then you're kind of looking for how much money do we want people to put in where people feel like they have skin in the game um, and that they'll really contribute to the success of the co-op. Um, and there's also a, an equity piece. So you can do cap, paid in capital on a kind of progressive sliding scale uh, type method. Um, so the fourth one is uh, another one member, one vote. You're not allowed to violate that. And the last three of this kind of glaze over because I don't think that they are the ones that are essential to co-ops. If you did the last three and weren't a co-op, you'd be a great organization. I mean, if you came up with the first four, you would still resemble a co-op in many ways, uh, but these are still really important, uh, but I'm gonna skip them for now. Um, so like I said, there are a lot of co-ops. Um, I mentioned housing a lot. That's a type of consumer co-op. Um, there's worker co-ops uh, and then there's a uh, marketing and producer type co-ops. Some of the consumer co-ops you'll see around town, um, Wheatsville co-op, the grocery store, REI co-op. Um, and you'll see a lot of large retail oriented businesses use the, the consumer co-op model. And it goes back to the, the paid in capital piece where these require a lot of investment. Like you need to rent a space, you need to buy the inventory, you need to cover your payroll. Um, so the consumer base is uh, easier to spread those costs in an equitable way than it is amongst the, you know, your, your low wage service employees that would be looking to work in a, a service sector. Um, and a good, a really good historical example of this is the rural electric co-ops. Um, so, you know, in the twenties and thirties, when people were first getting electricity, um, people were and rural areas weren't able to get it because the conventional for-profit firms did not find that to be a good use of their resources because it wouldn't be profitable. So a lot of rural uh, communities banded together to form their rural electric co-ops to bring power to themselves. Um, and pet analysis actually, in, uh, uh, you can find some pet analysis regions in Northwest Austin. Um, and then we'll talk a lot about housing co-ops in a minute. Uh, there's worker co-ops. Um, one of the, the classic worker co-op ideas that we use is a traditional firm is one in which capital hires labor. And in worker co-ops, it's said that labor hires capital. Um, so, so it's not the, it's laborers that benefit from the capital instead of vice versa. Uh, so you'll see a lot more low overhead firms operating as a question reader. Oh, you want me to speak up? Yeah, oh, thank you. Okay, 
Yeah, that does sound better. <laughs> Let me get a sip on breaking. So I was saying you see a lot of worker co-ops uh, operate with, uh, with low overhead to start with. So the bookkeeping co-op I worked for, pretty much the only overhead was some computers. Um, you see a lot of uh, home cleaning, uh, home care co-ops operate because these are labor intense um, industries. So in labor intense industries with low overhead is a really prime uh, target for, for converting uh, businesses into worker co-ops. I want to point out the Mondragon Co-op. Uh, in case y'all haven't heard of it, it's I think the biggest co-op in the world. It has 75,000 employees, um, and I just want to point out that like co-ops can get big and really become important parts of regional and national and even international in, uh, industries. I um, mean, they're based in the Basque region of Spain, so I think they're a really cool example. And they have their own kind of set of cooperative principles that they they follow. They got founded in the 50s. Um, this is one of my favorite slides because you'll probably recognize two logos here that you never knew were co-ops. Um, and uh, the first one is Ocean Spray, the cranberry juice. And so they, these are, this is the producers and marketing co-ops. And Ocean Spray is essentially a co-op of cranberry farmers. And the way that a lot of producer and marketing co-ops work is that they take some middleman out of the equation by banding together to form a co-op that acts as a market intermediary. Uh, so Ocean Spray, all the farmers operate this co-op to get their cranberries. Um, and all, Ocean Spray does some value add, so they add all the sugar to your cranberry juice um, and then sell it to you. Uh, so, so that's one way you often see uh, producers co-ops used. It's really common in the agriculture industry. Um, we have a cent like a Central Texas Farmers Co-op is a regional Central Texas organic farming co-op that brings organic food to markets. Uh, and a lot of the traditional like grain elevators in the mid Midwest were organized as agricultural co-ops. Yeah, so they're talking about farmers who are co-ops they're not talking about the right? Yeah, so so in, in, a, in a lot of the producer and marketing co-ops, it's typically businesses that are members. Um, not necessarily so, but but often is the case. And I think one counterexample of it is the, the last co-op that's on this slide is Polycot, and they are essentially freelance uh, web developers. So they kind of, they organize to get some resources that are more, that are better off when pulled together. So if they got a gig that was just more than an individual could do, they could spread it around other people that might not have as much work that week. And then also to share some kind of business infrastructure type stuff like payroll and banking. Uh, so that is a way that a producer co-op might be organized. Um, so why would you want to build a co-op? And there are a lot of different reasons why you would want a co-op. Um, I think uh, one of the, if you get into like the kind of academic thought on cooperatives, you'll often hear people say that it helps resolve broken market issues. Um, so this first talk, slide about access to goods and services is often that kind of issue. Um, so a, a really classic example that you'll see is fisheries, which are a common resource. They'll organize it as a, as a uh, co-op to prevent overfishing. The main lobster industry has large portions that operate under a co-op governance model. Um, the rural electric co-op example from earlier is also an example of this, like getting access to goods and services that you couldn't under a purely for-profit conventional firm model. Um, and kind of some of the other things we'll talk about today, like affordable housing in Austin. Like it's really hard to find unless you live in a co-op. Uh, or the Wheatsville Co-op, which was founded in the 70s, was one of the first natural foods before there was organic um, grocer in, in town, you know, way before Whole Foods got started. So this idea of um, providing goods and services that you just can't get under the traditional market uh, is a really common thought. Uh, they also make a good economic development strategy. So, because it keeps resources in the local community especially compared to other economic development strategies where you bring in a big corporation from out of town and then all, you know, you might get like a tax boost and some extra revenue, but it gets the, the profits and wealth gets extracted out of the community to where the owners are. And most co-ops are definitely very local, regional 
based. So the community wealth is easier to build. Uh, there's a commitment to the democracy, as I mentioned a couple times in the principles. Um, if you are particularly ideologically bent on supporting co-ops, this is a good for democracy, this is a good avenue. Um, and it definitely taught me a lot about politics and democracy and how government and governance works. Because when I was 19, I, I really didn't care that much about those kind of things. Um, and I'll say that like on a kind of macro level, most people work in conventional firms, which are essentially organized as an autocratic system, um, hierarchical autocratic. And a lot of these folks are the people that end up in kind of community groups and government. So it doesn't really surprise me when you find people that who've never really experienced a real democracy when you get into government and don't know how a democracy works. Um, they're great at building communities. We've got this great community space, so thanks, Rob, for helping us host this. <laughs> Rob and Moral House. Uh, and, you know, because you're operating these businesses in close proximity with all these people, it's a very easy, natural way to foster communities. And there's this kind of pervasive problem in modern America where people have been like, atomized and separated from the communities. So there's that whole phenomenon with the book uh, Bowling Alone that talked about the decline in bowling leagues and church attendance and social clubs and like that's not coming back like that's that's gone um, so this is an interesting alternative to try to build up community that's been lost over time you get to stay in your workplace um, because it is democratically managed by the people involved uh, most workplaces don't have that same thing for housing you get a lot of say in what you do with your housing co-op or your worker co-op. And there are tax advantages, um, which not that big a deal, to be honest. Uh, if you incorporate as a Texas co-op, chapter 251, you get a franchise tax exemption. So not a big deal, but it's there. So we'll get more into housing co-ops. Um, there's three different kinds. Um, so three different kinds you could potentially develop or be interested in developing. Um, and also, just so y'all are aware, I, uh, I handed Ali some surveys. Um, so if you're really interested in working on new co-ops, I've got a survey that kind of asks what is your area of interest for starting a new co-op, like what type of housing co-op, or whether you're a real estate professional or, or knowledgeable about finance. So just get, kind of try to get people together with the different skills you need to develop a co-op. Um, so you can go grab that now or at the end if, you, if, that, if you're inclined to do that. Um, so there are three different housing co-ops, uh, and this is kind of like business structure form. Uh, you can have a housing co-op in any type of building. So this is a mid-rise, but you see uh, housing co-ops in large houses or apartment complexes, you know, small apartment complexes. Um, so you can kind of put it anywhere, but this is uh, how it gets organized as a organization. And I made this beautiful graphic to help illustrate the differences. Um, so the first one, which is the most like um, a traditional firm. Um, so we'll use a condo as an example, because this is what it resembles, is a market rate co-op. And like a condo, an individual member owns their unit, their space, um, and they own it outright. Um, there are some limitations in that you can't own more than one unit to maintain the one member, one vote. Um, so it is different from a condo in that it has a lot of the, the co-op-y governance structures. Um, but you're allowed to sell your, your co-op membership on the open market at market prices. Um, and it's only really interesting as a, I think for, for this setting um, in kind of comparing it to the other, mo other models. Um, so you can see that the little co-op members own the title to their house um, completely. In the next model, it's the opposite. Um, so this is the group or common equity model. Um, and this is actually what every co-op in Austin operates under at the moment. Uh, and this is the co-op owns everything basically. It owns the real estate, it owns the business um, of the co-op um, and membership instead of being based on owning a ephemeral piece of a business share is based on a contractual agreement between the co-op and the members. So the co-op promises to provide um, housing, uh, and then the member in return gets has to help cover their share of the cost of the housing. And then they get to vote and set policy and manage the house how they like in a democratic way 
Um, and most housing co-ops also have a labor requirement, so you're obligated to pitch in some work um, to help maintain low costs. Um, so in a lot of ways, it, it operates as a nonprofit, and a lot of local co-ops are actually incorporated as nonprofit nonprofits. Um, and so you'll see a lot of this going on. The next one is the one that I'm personally, I think, most interested on a like development angle. Like this is something that I think about a lot and I'm trying to make in the future. And it's the limited equity model. And this is kind of like a mix of the two. Um, so it can vary between a group equity, which has like a standard deposit type situation. Um, so you might, it might be like a big deposit that you put into the co-op to, 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 to move in, or it could be something like 50 to 75, to maybe even 80, 90% of what it might be if it were on, on the market. Um, so some of the benefits of this model is that it does make it a little bit easier for individuals who have savings to finance a co-op, even without providing the actual full amount of financing. So you can get some interesting um, loan structures to kind of lower the down payment costs. Um, but it also has really great applications in, in affordable housing policy and maintaining affordable housing. Um, so there's, there's a two ways in which that people think about this in an affordable housing sense. Um, the first is that because it's a, you know, there's a limited equity piece here, the, there isn't the expectation that you can sell this on the open market to anyone who wants to have housing. There's kind of, it's harder to sell these um, interests in a co-op and it's typically mediated by the co-op instead of by the market. And um, there's often resale restrictions. So people who put in a fair amount of money and then live there for 20 years don't lose all the value that they put in um, due to inflation. So you typically you see things like uh, a resale restriction that is tied to inflation. So you're only allowed to get as much as you would have lost from inflation, or it could be just a straight like 1%, 2% kind of um, appreciation per year. Um, and uh, the other way that you see it kind of, well, and I, let me linger on that a little bit longer. So in affordable housing world, there's kind of the idea that you provide a subsidy and you can often lose the subsidy because it's essentially a wealth transfer. So like if I received a hundred grand from the government as a subsidy and buy a house with it, and then I sell the house, then I kept that hundred thousand dollars. And so the idea is that you want to try to keep the subsidy with the housing instead of with the individuals. That way you can perpetually maintain affordable housing instead of continuously funding it. Um, so this is kind of the, the, the thinking behind these resale restrictions. Um, then it also ties well with other affordable housing kind of methodologies. So you can put a limited equity co-op with, with the resale restrictions on a community land trust which is a, a land, basic, land basically owned by your taxing, uh, your taxing authority. So it's owned by the city or the county. They don't have to pay property taxes, so they pass along the savings to the residents. And so it, it pairs well with uh, other affordable housing situations. So to get specifically into the benefits of housing co-ops, uh, I think uh, there's definitely like a key, like talking to, the community piece and the social piece is, I think, one of the biggest components of the benefits of, of co-ops. And so to kind of emphasize that, I want to like tell you all about how I found out about the co-ops. So, you know, I found out from a friend of mine um, who was in class with me and she was organizing a, uh, you know, a club, extracurricular, like outdoorsy club I was interested in. And she's like, hey, we're having a meeting at Arrakis. And I thought it was cool that they named it after the planet Doom. Uh, so I was like, I got to go. Uh, that's awesome. And I didn't know it was a co-op. I didn't know what a co-op was. But, but I show up and like I look to my right and there's a couple of guys playing ping pong in the dining room because the dining table was a ping pong table. And there's some folks like studying in the living room, people cooking in the kitchen, and I can hear people talking upstairs. And I was just really amazed that this type of housing existed. Um, it like really reminded me a lot of when I would go visit my grandparents in Mexico. Uh, my mom's from there. We've got the big traditional Mexican extended family, so I get to see all the cousins and like aunts and uncles and hang out for a month. And I would always miss it when I would come home. Um, and just kind of like social isolation piece. I was like, there's something weird going on. Uh, 
so I think I think that is one of the biggest benefits. I think it's why you see a lot of people interested in co-ops in the first place and why they move in. And then I think there's a lot of kind of like economic and kind of ideological reasons why people really like stick with it in the long run. Um, but uh, the, one of the benefits of having like a really social environment is that there's a lot of social production that happens. And I think one of the, the really visible things is how food gets done. And we're in a kitchen. <laughs> there's a lot of food here. Uh, but there's bulk prep food in most co-ops. Uh, hey, Rob, how many meals do you cook a week during the semester? Oh, no. 14 meals. 14 meals a week. Um, so college houses has really big housing, so they've got the labor capacity to do that that much food. A lot of the other housing co-ops that are kind of in the 20 to 40 range, they're doing, you know, five to six meals a week, basically like two nights. Uh, but you know, you save the time of cooking meals on those days. Uh, someone has the labor; they're assigned to go buy the food and bring it. Uh, so you save the time with the grocery trips. Although some people will still go to the grocery store for kind of very individual items or like luxury items. So for me, I go to the store about every time my dog finishes her food. And then when I go, I'll typically buy dog food, two liters of soda, coffee, um, maybe some chocolate, uh, but I'm not going that often. And obviously like food is something that is very communal and sharing it. So that kind of adds to the community. Um, the next benefit is kind of I want to emphasize about car use. Um, sticking with the food example, uh, if you have 20 pe people going to the grocery store once a week, that's a lot more than if you've got one person going once or twice a week for 20 people. So you can save a lot on car trips. Um, and you know, when I'm at like local neighborhood meetings where we're talking about like reducing parking limits and those kind of things, like one of the biggest complaints you'll hear from people who support support like parking is it's like how am I going to get my groceries? Um, and so I'll often respond with this, like someone gets my groceries for me, fine. Um, as, so so you, you save on the transit for that. Um, you know, because it's a social environment, um, there's a lot more opportunities to, to engage in social uh, atmosphere. So you might be less inclined to drive to your friend's place or to the bar because you, that you have that experience at home. You know, it's easier to I get access to carpools. You know everyone you live with. Um, so I've totally been in the situation where someone knocked on my door and was like, can I borrow your keys? I've got an emergency. And you're happy to do it because, like, you know where they live. You know who their friends are. Like, like it's, it's, it's easy to imagine that they are trustworthy. Um, so I think the, the two things that I've talked about are kind of like intangible cost benefits and like social benefits. But there's some really huge measurable benefits to being in a housing co-op. And so co-ops are very affordable compared to your normal housing situation. Um, this graph comes from some research we did with ACBA in 2017. And we were finding, uh, compared to other housing in the neighborhood, prices ranging from 50 to 70% of market rate. Um, I think the, the, the one with the best performance was the Sunflower Co-op, which is in the Bolden neighborhood, just south of downtown, south of the river. Um, and I think, I think some of the keys to why they're affordable is that, you know, the longer it's been around, the more affordable it is. And obviously, if you're in a central area that's appreciating, then that comparison gets a little bit more extreme. Um, so we have a couple of ideas why uh, co-ops are this affordable. The first one comes from this, this concept that like a lot of the, the co-ops are doing labor to support the house. So you're talking about four to five hours a week, 20 people, that's 100 hours a week. That's like two full-time people of work that's getting accomplished by house members. So, you know, that's like a property manager and a couple of contractors that you're not having to pay every, every week. Um, so that's a huge component of, of the affordability. I think there's also this idea that you've removed like the capitalist owner from the equation, um, which is a little bit harder to emphasize to like really figure out what the impact of that is. But but I, the way that I like to think about it is that you know this owner is expecting a 
rate of return, right? A percent of growth every year. Um, and that's on top of cost. So the cost increased um, and then, then they get their rate of return. So you have this kind of linear plus exponential curve that increased costs. Um, and for housing co-op, you essentially eliminate the exponential part of this cost increase formula. And you're just, or at least the big, biggest component of it, you still have some of it in property taxes, depending on where you live. Um, property taxes can go up exponentially. Uh, but uh, basically you're talking about increases in utilities, food costs, um, and kind of like supplies and maintenance materials for, for the cost. So what is, what is driving costs to go up? And just for, I wish I had like a time series. Um, that's, we're planning on doing another one of these. Um, I think at La Reunion, just kind of anecdotally, I know that our rents go up between five and $20 a year, um, just kind of depending on how well the, the year went. Um, so it's, you know, it's pretty, pretty consistently the same instead of like an exponential growth on costs every year. So I live in La Reunion, which is an apartment complex, and I think it's one of the more multi-generational and diverse co-ops in town. Uh, most of the co-ops in town are actually student co-ops. It's about three quarters of the co-op community are student co-ops. And then a lot of the other co-ops are basically feeders, like people graduate and then move into them. So you typically tend to see a younger, educated crowd in co-ops. Um, but one of the things that I think has been really valuable about the La Reunion experience is that it's one of the only apartment complex style co-ops. So it's got a little bit more private space um, and just a little bit more space. And I think this has helped uh, get a more diverse and multi-generational um, housing. Um, and some of the benefits of having that, um, you know, we've got some elderly members at La Reunion. Um, there's two in particular that, that you know, kind of require um, assistance and like check-ins on occasion. One of them discovered that he had cancer right after he moved in. Um, and, you know, he needs help being in the hospital. And the other one I actually like was saw outside, he was smoking a cigarette and he couldn't talk right. And I ended up taking him to the hospital and found, we found out he had a stroke. So there's kind of this social uh, checking in on folks and making sure people are doing okay. Cause if either of them had disappeared for like, you know, three days, like you would know pretty quick that that was the situation. Um, we have one child living in our co-op. And I think if you had more parents living in co-ops, you'd see a lot more organized kind of babysitting. Um, so that is a potential benefit that you'll see, I think, as the co-op community expands. And there's a lot of skill sharing that happens uh, and kind of, yeah, skill sharing. So one of our members is a mechanic and he actually gets labor for helping folks fix the cars and the oil changes. Uh, some of our members are you know, programmers and developers and work with technology so they can help people out with their computer issues. Uh, I got a member that cuts my hair uh, every once in a while. There's one right now, actually. Um, you know, I, I do bookkeeping finance work. So, so sometimes people will ask me about kind of personal finance. How do I save more money? How do I budget type stuff? And I'm happy to help people out. So you get a lot of opportunity to, to meet folks uh, and work on it. Um, one of the ways that we've worked on de developing more diversity in La Reunion is that uh, we had this partner program where we work with housing nonprofits that specialize in placing people in housing. Um, and it's, it's been challenging. We've had some success with one in particular, which was the veteran placement, um, homeless vet placement from Caritas. Um, and we've had two members that I, from that program that have been pretty successful. Um, one of them actually was the, the person who developed cancer and the other one was a homeless uh, person of color who was able to move in. And I think that's been a really cool experience because of I think the, the barracks life and the social atmosphere of co-op, like they actually do, did pretty well, I think, or adjusted pretty, pretty well to it. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, so in some other ways, uh, we once had a member that got mugged. We did a GoFundMe for him to raise some money to like get him back on his feet. And there's also some amount of political diversity. You see a lot of socialist lefty type people and then moderates and liberals and even some, some libertarians. Uh, and you know, kind of given that amount of diversity, I think there's a lot of socialist aspects of cooperative housing. So I think there's a lot of good opportunities to 
had conversations with people who, who, you know, aren't socialists to expose them to uh, the model. Uh, and so I know probably none of you agree with this quote, but I think it shows that there are people that feel that at some level, or people who are not socialists that at some level believe that there is some place for collective ownership and collectivized institutions. And, and I think this community co-op level of organization is a really good place to have those kind of conversations um, and talk about those kind of things. And I, I spent a really long time trying to find a definitive source. I found a couple, but none of them were definitive. But I've heard in a few different places, so I think, I think it was pretty interesting. Um, and there have been some socialist critiques of housing co-ops, um, and they've been around for a long time. I think Karl Marx expressed something like this, and then Garl Peravitz in uh, America Beyond Capitalism also expressed this kind of sentiment. And the idea is that even if you have a co-op, they will be obligated by the environment and the incentives, incentive structures structures in place to act like capitalists. Um, and, and I think like these folks will tell you that it's not like that they shouldn't do that, that maybe it shouldn't be the biggest priority is the argument. Um, and uh, I'll say in my experience, I, I think that like, because the people who benefit from a co-op are vastly different from your traditional firms that even if they, you know, even if you have like, you know, a homeless veteran who's acting like a capitalist, you know, he's getting something out of the deal. So I think it still helps communities that have been exploited heavily by, by capitalist structures. So even if you assume this is true, I think it's still a great model for helping people and supporting them. So if, if that didn't convince you to not be involved in co-ops, here are some ways you can be involved in co-ops. Uh, I think the easiest way to get more involved um, in the sense that you'll learn a lot and there's a, like not a lot of risk is to move into a co-op. It's actually pretty hard to get into a co-op. This is literally pretty much all the co-ops in Austin at the moment. And the student co-ops make up 600 of the 800 people that live in housing co-ops. Um, so it can be tough to get in, uh, but it is a really educational experience and you'll learn a lot. And if you're interested in starting a co-op, I think it helps a lot to have had the experience of being in one and managing one. Um, you know, so I'm with the ACBA, we're like a chamber of commerce for co-ops. So we do a lot of advocacy work. Um, so you can come volunteer with us. So I'm the chair of our housing committee and we've done a lot of work at City Hall. We've passed a couple of pieces of legislation at City Hall. One of them guaranteeing that we could get access to the bond funding, funding from the recent bond campaign. Um, and we've done some cool things like get the city to really look at a tenant opportunity to purchase, um, particularly for like neglected properties. Um, and that is slowly the gears are turning on those things. Um, so we, we do, you know, local advocacy. Um, if you feel guilty about shopping on Amazon because we're a giant corporation, you can feel exactly half a percent less guilty by using our Amazon Smile accounts. Um, you can find that on acba.coop. A lot of this ACBA stuff you can find on our website, acba.coop, or on our Facebook. Um, and that's the best way to find out about events that are, that are going on. Or you can start a co-op. Um, and you know, this is a simple framework that I got from the Texas World Cooperative Center. They are a like Texas-based uh, co-op development nonprofit that, that's based out of the, the uh, UT Rio Grande. And one of the ACBA board members actually works with them doing development. So she's been a good resource for things like strategic planning um, and kind of helping people get oriented to the co-op community. Um, so to start a housing co-op, I think there's like, you need to think about it like a real estate project. There are four things that you need for a real estate project. And, and I stole this four things framework from a guy named John Anderson, who does incremental development. Um, as opposed to like big capital intensive track development. So I think it's kind of a good, similar to co-op, I'm happy to plug, plug his work. Um, but so there's four things that you need to have a real estate development. And the idea is that you as the person who's starting a co-op project should be an expert or at least very good at one of these four things. 
And then it's typically really hard to get a second person who is an expert who believes in your project enough to help you. But once you got two, it's pretty easy to get the other two and, and finish the project. Uh, and you know, there is no real particular order. Um, some of these are a little bit more important than others, and there are some that I think you can kind of minimize and reduce the impact of. And I'll, I'll point those out when we get there. Um, but this is really kind of a chicken or egg cyclical process. You do a little bit of one thing and do the next thing, and you know, come back around. Um, so we'll get into it. So this thing is property. So you can be the expert and kind of control this if you are the owner of the property or you have a friend who is really dedicated to the idea, who owns the property. This is typically a difficult one, um, unless you're older and have money and have been around for a while. Uh, if you don't have access to property, then you're gonna have to find a real, real estate agent that will work with you. You know, they get paid on commission, so it's usually not that hard to find a real estate agent. Uh, we do have a, some real estate agents in town that are from the co-op community, that, that we can kind of help you get in touch with, that we are in touch with, um, and they will actively help, help us look for properties and evaluate properties. Um, and when you're looking at properties, like I think the, the key is to find a property, you know, in your price range, you know, in the right location, but, but if you're actually evaluating a building, I think the key is you wanna find a building that has enough common space um, to, foster spontaneous social interactions um, and for there to be organized social activities. And then I'll also add that you want this common space to be between someone's private space and the exit to the property. So I think to use a, an example that, that makes sense is uh, you have a property with a courtyard, right? Everyone leaves their apartment and they're in this courtyard. Um, if this was organized in such a way that the doors were facing out and then everyone walked onto this, you know, like a walk up and then everyone walked out into the streets, that would be a bad example of a co-op because everyone just leaves without having the chance to interact with other people. You know, another classic example is another courtyard apartment as opposed to a motel where you walk out and get in the car. Um, garages attached to private spaces that don't don't buy that house or, or convert the garage into a bedroom like, do not use that property um, so so i think there's a lot of variability you'll see a lot of options uh, price can be difficult you might look kind of not in central austin to find more affordable properties or even outside of austin um, i think i think the real estate market in central austin is getting to be really hard there's still stuff available but it's challenging Uh, the next thing is entitlements. And when we were organizing this, Marina said that y'all would maybe have an entitlement conversation. Uh, it's not really that important for, for my purposes, so I'll keep it brief. Uh, it's basically, can you build a co-op on the land? You might have great land. You might even have a great property that suits your co-op. But if you're not allowed to have a co-op there because the rules and regulations don't allow it, then you can't do that. Uh, this is also a pretty hard one to be like the expert in. You know, the experts in entitlements are the people who are at City Hall trying to get your property rezoned and facing a bunch of uh, neighborhood opposition. So those are the kind of folks that are good at that. And for this, you just kind of want to minimize it and just ask your real estate agents or just own a property that doesn't have any of these restrictions. Just go for the thing that you can put a co-op on. Um, so the two big restrictions that you're going to want to make sure that you are not encountering when you're looking at property are the unrelated person's occupancy limit is the first one. And that is four or six unrelated people in one unit. One way you can avoid it is, um, we do this at La Reunion. So La Reunion has two bedroom apartments, 700 square feet. Um, the limit for each unit is six people. It's pretty hard to have six unrelated people occupying 700 square feet. We haven't done it yet. No one's gotten close to wanting it yet. Um, it just has not been an issue. So you can make it not an issue in your development by having many discrete units that are relatively small. 
Um, the other way to avoid this issue is just to make sure that your property has the group residential use. And the group residential use is kind of the, the boarding home, frat house, dorm, co-op use. And it allows you to have more than six people in a unit. And uh, the, it's not really common. These are hard to find. It's in what's called multifamily four and more intense. So we're talking about apartment buildings with 15 to 20 units and bigger. So you're talking about like things that a developer could buy for a lot of money and put a mid-rise apartment on. So the price competition is pretty steep on these lots. Um, so also kind of something that you want to avoid unless you're pretty savvy. If you get a really small lot that's MF4, like that can be effective because uh, the developer can't put a structured parking spot on it. So that's, that's one way that you could get access to this MF4. Um, so yeah, if you want to try to avoid these things, and, and minimize the impact of the impediments. The next thing is financing. Um, this is tricky and is really hard to avoid no matter what, even if you're just renting a building to put your co-op in, you're still gonna have to put deposits down uh, and you're probably talking about making a commercial lease and, and getting guarantors. Um, and I'm working with a project right now that's like right in the middle of it, um, of trying to like get this commercial lease. So uh, I've seen that this can be challenging even if you're just leasing a building. Um, and so some of the challenges are that your big lending institutions don't really know what co-ops are. Like talk to your average mortgage officer and they don't know what a co-op is. So, so it's hard to get money. Um, and some of the co-op principles that make it um, in opposition to capitalism means that it's hard to get capitalists on board, like kind of no duh, but that is one of the reasons why it's hard to get financing because you're not willing to give the person with the money voting rights in your organization just because they have money. Um, so that can be a challenge for, for getting financing. Um, so what, what you need to, to get the financing is either the individuals in your development project need to have enough resources, enough income, enough savings to do these things on their own, or you need to partner with someone who, you know, probably one of the local co-op groups or kind of development um, companies that, that does that and is able to support that. Um, and, and really what the bank is looking for is like a track record. So if you've made a lot of money in your life and you can show the bank that, they don't really care what you're doing as long as you can pay them back. So that is the benefit of working with the banks is they don't, they don't actually care that much about whether you're a co-op or not. I mean, if you're working from, a, from a inside of a co-op to kind of expand an existing co-op, presumably that co-op's been around for a long time. And College House has been around since like the 60s or 70s. So it's, it's not that challenging for them to, maybe in the 50s, um, it's not that challenging for them to get financing. You know, once they have the, the hour long conversation, like, well, this is what a co-op is. Um, and, and there are institutions that are co-op friendly that, that you can approach as your first uh, financiers. Um, you know, once you've kind of got the, the, base, the, the basic setup of people who can provide the down payment, like you, know, you can have a less difficult conversation with a, with a loan officer who already knows what a co-op is. And we've got some of them up here. Um, the first two are uh, Community Development Finance Institution, CDFIs. I think that's what that acronym stands for. Um, the second one is a kind of revolving loan fund grant program, the third one is. And then obviously you all know what the last one is, we can get bond money from them. Uh, so that, and they have guaranteed to me that co-ops have access to it and they know we exist. So it's something that I'd like to see happen. We haven't done it yet. We haven't gotten bond money from the city yet. So it's still kind of a, they say you can, but let's, let's make it happen. So the last thing, uh, which I think is, going to be the easiest for a group like you that has people and organizing skills is kind of getting the, the tenants slash members that are going to move in. Um, this is something, you know, that can be challenging if you're not, if you don't have already a, a community of like-minded people to do. Um, and so, so for, for the, the group of folks that is looking to move in and organizing it, obviously there's, there's a few things like if you're a group of people looking to start a co-op, you're going to have to convince those other the, the other three groups of people that have the other things that you need 
to believe in you. So you've got to make that happen. Um, and you can do this by, you know, reaching out to real estate agents, you know, reaching out to banks, kind of doing a lot of the things that we were just talking about, um, you know, meeting and setting up co-op structures, maybe talk about like bylaws and who's good at what and kind of, kind of start to build the co-op before you move into the co-op. Um, so that's a big role of any group of future co-op members. Um, and then, you know, once you're kind of in the, the zone where you look like you're gonna make it happen, um, then a really big key is having flexibility and move in or at least enough, like enough financing available that you can kind of eat the costs of low vacancy or of low occupancy, high vacancies when you first start the co-op because even if you strive to have like the most flexible group of people, not everyone's going to be able to move on August 1st. Um, so some of the strategies I've seen for people who have been flexible, because, and this is true for just looking to move into a co-op or pretty much any housing situation. Um, you know, the, the people who are flexible are the people that are on a month to month lease. They live on their friend slash parents couch. Um, they live in an existing co-op that maybe they can convince everyone to vote to let them out of their contract. Um, and so these are all strategies that I've seen people use to be flexible on the, the move in date and time period. And yeah, you want to have like the diversity of skills that I was talking about that you, that you need to, to start a co-op. So I've got a couple of strategies for starting co-ops that I've seen work. Uh, the first is kind of the independent lease co-op. So you've got a group of people um, you don't have a lot of money, so you're going to rent a house or a building to be in. Uh, you, you find something that doesn't have the entitlements and suits your needs, and you, know, you move in. Um, and this is actually fairly common. I've seen, I've known a lot of people, a lot of college co operators who this is essentially what they do. Like, they, uh, they just, they like co-ops, they, they do it kind of informally, and then, you know, they move in. Um, there's some pros and cons. This is kind of like the quick and dirty way of making a co-op requires the least amount of resources. You don't have to form a, a legal entity, right? You can do it as a partnership, an informal partnership. Uh, pretty much every other co-op is gonna require you to have like a nonprofit or be incorporated as a co-op. The cons are you, you miss out on some of the, the really great uh, price impacts from still having a landlord. Um, that you, you might get some of it depending on your landlord. You might get the landlord who doesn't care if you do all the maintenance, so they reduce your rent because you're taking on the work. So you do get a little bit of that benefit if, if you can if you can get that kind of agreement with your landlord, but you don't get the, the big bucks kind of cost reductions by not only by by having the landlord. Um, yeah, so it's not affordable. It's hard to get support from other local institutions that, that would support a co-op. Um, one, because you're less likely to have engaged with these support structures in your founding because it was quick and easy and that's, that's how it happened. Uh, and also there isn't as much to lose. If you're a co-op in crisis and you own of an expensive piece of land, there's a lot more to lose. And so it's a lot easier to, to really get help from people who are invested in the community to get the help. So this is the least long-term stable way, but it is a way to get people's foot in the door and starting projects. Um, the next one is same idea, but you buy it instead. So the differences in this one is that either your members are um, got more, got a little bit more money, or you're working with individuals that, that can support it. Um, but it's still kind of done as a solo project. Um, and these, I think, are kind of the hardest ones to make happen. Uh, you've seen, I've seen it happen a couple times in, in the existence of Austin. A lot of the early college co-ops essentially had to do it this way. Um, some of the Sunflower Co-op uh, did it this way. Whitehall, I think, Whitehall's getting real old. I'm not actually sure how they did it, but I know they own it and they're independent. So they got there somehow. Um, and then, so someone kind of did that, someone's in the Zilker neighborhood, um, they had some support, which I'll get into in a minute. Uh, yeah, so this one has long-term affordability and has the financing issues that I mentioned already. So this one is the one that I think 
you kind of see have the most success in Austin. This is expanding the co-op from an existing co-op. This is how La Reunion was founded. This is how basically all the college co-ops, except for the very first ones, were founded. Um, so Sona was somewhat in this way because they were able to get college houses to guarantee um, the purchase, the, the lease of a building, and then they entered a crisis. And because they had a relationship with a big co-op institution, they were able to get bought um, and incorporated into some co-op institutions to stabilize it. Um, so they were able to work their way up into an ownership position. Um, so like I said, this is the most stable way to do it. You typically have an institution that has the financing, um, has the, the resources and kind of membership and skills to make a co-op happen. Um, so for this kind of project, you kind of have a lot of the hard part done with, and then it's just uh, you know, work for six months to a year to nail down where you're gonna live and who's gonna move in. Um, so most successful, but you don't always have a, a local co-op that is willing and able to provide that type of institutional support. So you, if, if the timing is not right, you may have to rely on one of the, the other two models. Um, so yeah, and I'm getting into these when I talk about them. So, so stable, harder to do, lots of different cats to, to herd. Um, and I did want to talk about something that I didn't include in the slideshow, which I think is really cool that I think a lot of y'all heard of, but we are looking at converting mobile homes um, to cooperatives in Austin. Um, today, this kind of just happened like in the last few weeks. Um, so that's a really exciting project um, that's being done by, by uh, CHIA, which is the Law Reunion South Sasona organization. Uh, and so that's just a completely other model. And I am not an expert on that. so. Just want to like mention it, but I can't really tell you a lot of the details about it. Um, and that's it. You know, 